Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and to speak with you today. Um, thanks very much to Jonathan and the organizing committee for the invitation. Um, please let me know if you cannot hear me because my voice does not always carry that well. Um, today, I'm going to talk about the work that we've done in defining resistance and resilience concepts in the western portion of the range, really in the Great Basin. And I'm also going to talk to you about the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies project that essentially use these concepts, couple them with our understanding of sage grouse habitat to develop a prioritization system that effectively incorporates both knowledge of resistance and resilience as well as sage grouse habitat. So as we know, our cold desert sagebrush ecosystems occur over strong environmental gradients. Over those gradients, they increase in elevation and productivity, also fuels. They range from relatively warm and dry Wyoming big sage systems all the way up to our cold and moist mountain big sagebrush and mountain sage and mountain brush systems. Because of these differences, they differ oftentimes significantly in resistance and resilience. About 15 years ago, my colleagues and I started a series of experiments to increase our understanding of how that resistance and resilience differ. When we talk about resilience, we can think about the potential of these systems to recover following disturbance and stress. And when we think about resistance, especially resistance to some of our invasive animal grasses, we can think about the attributes of the system that prevent the population growth of those invasive species. In 2002, we started a joint fire sciences program study that effectively looked at the effects of prescribed fire on these systems over the elevation gradient I just described. Essentially Wyoming sagebrush, mountain sagebrush, and mountain brush systems. We focused in on those intermediate tree densities that phase two system. And I'm going to report the results basically from the perennial grasses and forbs because in our sagebrush ecosystems, when we remove either sagebrush or the pinion and juniper trees, it is those perennial grasses and forbs that determine the resilience of these systems. If you look, first of all, at the control plots, <laughs> That's pretty wild. <laughs> Basically what you see is that expected increase in productivity over the elevation gradient. If you look at the burn plots, basically what you see is that the higher elevation mountain brush systems recover more rapidly. They also exhibit smaller change in species composition and as a consequence, exhibit higher resilience. Now, a second component of this study looked at the effects of fire over essentially a tree cover gradient, where tree cover went from 12 to 38 to 74 percent. This focused on our intermediate elevation mountain big sagebrush systems. What we see here is that we have the expected decline in biomass over that tree cover gradient as we go from low to high tree covers. If we look at the control plots, essentially what we see is that when we have relatively low tree covers, we move the trees, we get a favorable response of that understory vegetation. And if we look essentially at the high tree cover plots, I think I'll uh, omit that. <laughs> um, basically what we see is that we have a much slower response in terms of recovery. And in addition, we have an increase in annual grasses and forbs indicating higher invasibility. Now, we can put this all together in this graph. Basically, what it shows you is that resilience increases over those elevation gradients. But as we all know, it's modified by soil characteristics and then also aspect. There is a strong relationship between our sagebrush types, soil temperature and moisture regimes, and also resistance and resilience. And this is really a powerful management tool. 
When we disturb these systems, um, especially when we remove those perennial grasses and forbs, or um, when we have vegetation changes that decrease their competition, we oftentimes have a significant decrease in resilience. Now, at the same time, we initiated a series of experiments that looked at the effects of grass and forb removal, and then also fire on cheatgrass establishment, growth, and reproduction. This essentially shows you the number of plants, which indicates establishment, over that same elevation gradient. You're looking here at burned and unburned plots. Removal did not have an effect on establishment of cheatgrass. Burning actually decreased the establishment, and that was because more severe soil surface conditions, um, darker soils, higher temperatures, resulted in lower survival and growth of those species. One of the most important things I want you to notice here is that there's a significant decrease in establishment over that elevation gradient. Although cheatgrass can germinate in those relatively cold and moist soil conditions, growth and survival are severely limited. Now, the second component of this study essentially looked at the effects of removal and fire on the biomass, the growth, if you will, and then also seed production. And basically, we saw slightly different results. If we look first at our removal plots, what we saw is that the results were consistent across the gradient, and they were also additive. When we removed those perennial grasses and forbs, we basically saw a two to three-fold increase in the biomass and seed production of cheatgrass. When we both, when we removed, <coughs> excuse me, when we burned those plots, what we saw was a three to six-fold increase in biomass and reproduction. But most significantly here, if we've already removed the perennial grasses and then we burn them, we can get anywhere from a 10 to 30-fold increase in biomass and reproduction of cheatgrass. Now, this is because we see a, an increase in soil resources, both water availability and then also nutrient availability. What this clearly indicates is that fire can increase cheatgrass because of that increase in resources, but removal <coughs> of those perennial grasses and forbs, the loss of those perennial grasses and forbs, greatly magnifies this effect. And we've conducted a series of management experiments since then, basically our sagebrush treatment evaluation project that confirms that we see these exact results when we conduct various management treatments, whether or not they be tree removal, um, sagebrush mowing, or prescribed fires. Now, in terms of resistance to cheatgrass, and that is, of course, the species we have the best information on, what we see is an increase in resistance over that elevation gradient. Our Wyoming sagebrush systems are most climatically suited to cheatgrass growth and production. Our mountain brush systems are least climatically suited in addition, those relatively cool and moist conditions result in higher productivity, higher competition with those invasive animal grasses and other invaders that might arrive in these systems. Now, in 2013, the WAFA, Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Association group, was initiated essentially to develop a scientific basis that used our understanding of resistance and resilience concepts, coupled it with our knowledge of sagegrass habitat, to prioritize areas for management in the western portion of the, green, of the range, the Great Basin, if you will, and to determine the best management strategies across scales. We published a strategic, multi-scale approach that used resilience and resistance concepts reduce the impacts of invasive annual grasses and altered fire regimes in sagebrush ecosystems and greater sagegrass habitat in the fall of 2014. That approach was subsequently incorporated into the BLM Fire and Invasives Assessment, essentially the FIOP process, if you've heard about it, that was used just in the last year to develop a multi-year program of work for 
management treatments in the western portion of the range in the Great Basin. That approach is also be being used as the basis for developing a similar effort in the eastern portion of the range, that's the sagebrush management, resistance, and resilience tool. And in addition, it is being used as a basis for developing a common science strategy um, for the Secretarial Order 3336 and the implementation of the rangeland fire prevention, management, and restoration effort. Now the approach basically has six components. It basically couples that understanding of ecosystem resilience and resistance with the understanding of our key sage grouse habitat or basically the habitat of any particular species. It uses that information along with an assessment of the various threats, again, to delineate those local habitats for management and to determine the most appropriate management approach. It is basically scalable from the landscape to the site. Now, in terms of developing our resistance and resilience concepts, one of the first things we did was to look at the key ecological types, and we can think of these just as a higher level of our ecological sites, and to look at those relationships, look at the relationships of those ecological types to both soil temperature and moisture regimes and resistance and resilience. So our mountain big sagebrush, bitterbrush, and snow prairie sites with cool and summer moist soil conditions, um, frigid oostic in soil terms, have moderate to high resilience and resistance. But if we step down basically to our Wyoming big sagebrush systems with warm and summer moist to dry conditions, um, we're looking at moderate <coughs> soil resilience and low <coughs> resistance to cheatgrass. Now, because of the strength of the relationship of those um, ecological sites to both the soil temperature and moisture regimes and resistance and resilience, we can basically use soil temperature and moisture regime data to indicate resilience and resistance at large landscape scales. This basically shows the NRCS soil survey data, um, the soil temperature and moisture regimes for the eastern portion of the range, management zones of one, the top, two, in the middle, and then of course seven when we drop down into the Colorado Plateau and Southern Rocky Mountains. If you look specifically at that Colorado Plateau area, Southern Rocky Mountains where we are right now, um, you can see that those red to red-brown areas are essentially the warm and dry areas with low resi resistance and resilience. Um, the bluish areas um, are moving up into our cooler and moisture systems. These have moderate to high resilience and resistance. Now, in order to link our understanding of resistance and resilience with stage grass habitat, We've used the sage grouse breeding habitat probability model that Kevin Doherty spoke about yesterday. Essentially, this uses um, a multivariate approach to relate those 2010 to 2014 breeding bird densities from the LEX to general habitat characteristics, including sagebrush cover and then also conifer cover, as well as climate, landform, and disturbance. Um, we believe that this is a um, better approach than simply looking at sagebrush cover because it includes a suite of variables that determine sagebrush habitat. Um, you're looking essentially at, of course, those breeding bird probabilities for the eastern portion of the range, a red, relatively low, dark blue, high. Now, Kevin spoke a little bit about our sagebrush habitat matrix this is where we can couple our understanding of resistance and resilience with those sage grouse habitat probabilities to really develop a spatially explicit approach for prioritizing management and determining the best management strategies. Um, the rows essentially indicate resistance and resilience. The columns are low, medium, and high probability of sage grouse habitat. We look first at that high resistance and resilience areas. 
we know that we're looking at relatively high restoration and recovery potential. In most cases, our native grasses and forbs are going to be sufficient for recovering. And we know that the risk of annual invaders is low. Most of these sites um, require little intervention once disturbed, especially if those perennial grasses, grasses and forbs are in place. Specific management activities might be seeding sagebrush, following fire, or other types of disturbances, and then also increasing connectivity by removing and uh, expanding conifer populations. If we look basically at our low, uh, warm and dry, low resistance and resilience Wyoming big sage systems, what we see here, of course, is that both restoration and recovery potential are low. Oftentimes, those native grasses and forbs are inadequate to really promote recovery of these sites. The risk of those annual grasses, like cheatgrass, is high. And it may require multiple management interventions if we are actually to restore these. These are the areas of highest risk. Um, we can certainly decide to restore those. We just need to be able to allocate sufficient resources to do the multiple interventions that it may take to actually um, maintain and restore those systems. Now, in terms of prioritization, if we look at the um, probabilities of sage-grouse habitat, um, we can see that basically those low probability areas have a low potential to support viable populations of sage-grouse. They're typically going to be our lowest priority areas. Those medium areas, in terms of the probability of sage-grouse habitat are the areas where we can really focus management efforts to increase, improve habitat, and increase sage-grouse populations. And then uh, finally, when we're in those high probability areas, these are the areas that we want to really protect, uh, to maintain, and to the degree possible, increase the characteristics that promote resistance and resilience. Um, Management strategies here, of course, would be fire prevention um, in places where that's an issue, um, and then appropriate livestock grazing, and general management activities such as proactive uh, control of weedy invaders um, to maintain and increase those perennial grasses and forbs. Now, we can link our management strategies directly to the cells in the matrix for the eastern portion of the range. These include things like fuel breaks, um, also removal of expanding conifers, and then restoration activities, as well as things such as, um, again, that proactive weed control, as, along with um, appropriate livestock grazing strategies, um, as well as something we heard quite a bit about yesterday, um, de developing conservation easements. The particular strategies can be organized by threat, and that's how we're doing it in the eastern portion of the range, where we can think of the ecosystem threats as being those non-native invasive species, wildfire and conifer expansion, the policy or regulatable threats, if you will, are livestock grazing, agronomic conversion, exurban development, energy development, and then also recreation. And for the eastern portion of the range, we're also going to try to address climate change, and we're also going to utilize this same approach for the common science framework. Now, in order to develop prioritization, of course, we have geospatial tools and maps that we can, be, can use to both visualize and quantify the degree of threat um, focal areas for management should consider both population abundance and their relative resistance and resilience. The first filters that we are using basically are the greater sage grouse priority areas for conservation. And you can also extend this to the Gunston sage grouse critical habitat areas. This basically shows you an overlay of the sage grouse population index developed by Kevin Doherty and his colleagues and then also relative resistance and resilience. The green areas show moderate to high resistance and resilience, the red, low resistance and resilience, and then the bright green areas and the bright red areas are high density. We can further divide this according to additional categories. In terms 
of addressing threats, focal areas for management, consider the magnitude of the, of the threat relative to populations and resistance and resilience. This essentially shows the cover of conifers overlaid on the packs and the critical habitat. This uses land fire, but the Blue Mountain Joint Venture Project should be developing and releasing more refined conifer cover layers that can be used in the very near future. Now when we step down to the site, and uh, Steve and Jonathan are almost out of time, management activities are really based on that site response, their resistance and resilience, coupled with those habitat needs. We have a lot of decision tools, our soil and ecological site descriptions, as well as soil <coughs> and transition models, and at this level, we can bring in that local expertise and that local data, uh, things like the sage grouse root rearing habitat model that Cam Aldridge showed us yesterday. And just to wrap up, in the western portion of the range, the Great Basin, we've developed a series of decision tools, really field guides and handbooks that can be adapted to the Gunnison area, to the eastern portion of the range. And in addition, we've developed a series of management fact sheets that can also be used. With that, I would like to thank all of the many collaborators and individuals that have contributed to this work um, over the past many years. Thank you. 